And it so happens that I, an unsuspecting student of theories in history, have received insights in a most unanticipated way, not from books or articles, as is the common route, but from the more ancient mode of dreams, or rather, to employ the prophetic phraseology, visions of the night. Note, in actuality, the content of these visions has given me much reason to doubt that they were mere dreams. But I will leave that discussion for another time. And now, it is with great timeliness that I present to you this retelling of these strange visions concerning mankind in the year 2018 and the years soon to follow. For the sake of accuracy, each vision is retold in the present tense, first-person style, just as it was experienced, in a manner of speaking. Note, the many crude illustrations and diagrams that accompany these visions are only meant to provide a rough approximation of the many wondrous vistas and over-the-top beings that I encountered along the way. Is there proof? Yes. The second religiousness, as foretold by German scholar Oswald Fenger, has indeed returned to the stage of world history. And behold, in a vision of the night, I find myself in a gloomy room where I am confronted by five stone doors of different shapes. They pulsate as if possessing a, a life of their own. Moreover, each door now glows with a phosphorescent neon green radiance. How exceedingly elders I remark to myself. I marvel at the phosphorescence of the door now, for the powers by which they glow I comprehend not. But alas, there is no time to ponder on this. The floor suddenly turns a deep carmine red, and the walls of the room turn a monochromatic pumpkin orange. Then, without any forewarning, the walls crack in a manner remindful of a cracked windshield on an old car. How inscrutable! What would be the meaning of these phenomena, I say aloud, but I do not expect my words to elicit a response. Listen to my words, human, a supernatural sounding voice rumbles from behind me, and I shall tell you the meaning of these phenomena. I turn around and behold, it is a giant flying gullum penguin. It is immense in stature, measuring over nine cubits. Moreover, its body is of the most singular composition. Its wings are of copper, its core of hematite stone, its feet of gold, and its belly of polished peridot stone. Now listen, human, says the massive bird Gullum, its voice raspy and deep, its posture direct and unemotional. The five doors symbolize the five digits of the human hand. This is the power that mankind has to exercise its will over all the earth until the time of the emergence of the strong AI and the coming technological singularity. Technological singularity, I say with a gasp. Are you referring to that hypothetical moment in the relatively near future where exponential progress and technological advancements give rise to a superintelligence? Heed it as you say, answers the monstrosity of a penguin. I continue my inquiry. And are you implying that this superintelligence will be capable of performing a runaway reaction of self-improvement cycle? as asserted by a futurist like Ray Kurzweil? Again, it is as you say, answers the avian rod aspirin, but this time with a noticeable smugness. My inquiry still continues. And what does the eerie green glow of the door knob represent, I ask with an intensified curiosity. Ah, this is the most essential question, responds the colossal bird Gullum. The green glow represents the strange mystery surrounding mankind's potential as pertains to this age. By the words this age, you mean to say the age before the technological singularity. Precisely, you mean. You see, the period of history in which you now find yourself is right with contradictions regarding the meaning of life, society, and the individual. True enough, Mr. Penguin, but isn't every age so with its own similar troubles and conflicts? For example, don't ancient works of literature, such as the Hebrew Book of Ecclesiastes, say things like the following? What has been, what has, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? No, it has been already done in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of the former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the latter things, the things yet to be done among those who come after. Upon hearing these words, the penguin at once erupts in agitation. Oh, come on now, the giant avian gullum scoffs. Did the time of Solomon have robots with machines unfounded on them? Or bots that can prepare fast food? 
or self-driving cars that will replace millions of human workers in perhaps 15 years? Well, did they? You have a good point there, I rightfully concede. Anyhow, what does the floor of what does the floor of deep carmine and the crackling walls of orange represent? I push these questions quickly because the foul foul seems increasingly vexed by my presence. Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, I have changed my mind, the bird proves. I have decided not to tell you the full signification of these things, for you have offended me by your previous statements concerning the book of Ecclesiastes. Yet by no means shall I make known to you the full signification of the vision. The penguin, the penguin's mouth now seems to open, close, and reopen in a half laughing motion. In other words, he is displaying his own distinct brand of perturbation. If I have offended you, then I apologize, is the only response that I can muster. Apology not accepted, the penguin snapped as it shifted its eyes upward, but I do have some advice for you before we go. Which is what? I answer reflexively, quickly trying to gain any more information I can. From now on, you will do well to pay closer attention to the purpose to the purported new truths of your age, particularly those who attempt to submerge the, the study of studies of philosophy and ethics with the biological sciences. Why? Because there is an emerging trend in academia to support all to subordinate all human thought to the framework of evolutionary biology, to categorize all constructs as being either adaptations or exaptations within the process of natural selection. And what's so bad about that? I egg the bird on. To be frank, such a trend is, does a disservice to the cause of pure thought. That's a serious proposition, but don't you think you're exaggerating the danger? Science is always about testing ideas. And besides, we can see that but you don't understand the the, the dullum bird interrupts. Don't you realize that your civilization is undergoing the second religiousness? The second relay what? I stopped in the attempt and filled with perplexity. Yes, the second religiousness. That stage in human civilization best explained by German scholar Otto Fendler, who describes how every great culture begins with a mighty theme of the spirit that emerges from the, in the countryside and closes with the finale of materialism to the world cities. The second religiousness appears in all civilizations as soon as they have fully formed themselves as such and are beginning to pass slowly and imperceptibly into the non-historical state in which time periods cease to mean anything. The material of the second religious embraces the whole world of primitive religion in the guise of a popular syncretism of materialist of materialistic beliefs and primitive religion. Source, the decline of the West by Oswald Spengler. Mr. Penguin, are you saying that the natural course of all high cultures is to depart from their founding religious precepts and to adopt the materialistic worldview? Such is the case. And furthermore, are you saying that the emerging civilization will then seek to form a syncretism between the materialism, between materialism and the earliest elements of primitive religion? Quite so. And still furthermore, are you saying that thought leaders like Jordan D. Peterson are effectively promoting a syncretism between science and religion in a manner precisely in line with what one would expect during a second religiousness period of history? It is as you have said. And with that, the golden penguin stretches its wings turns around and takes off flying, gradually vanishing while still in mid-flight. Hey, please don't go before clarifying more on this last point. I am now jumping up and down and fiercely waving my hand in the direction of the monster, making my appeal for it to stay and clarify. But alas, not several moments later, he has totally vanished. Chapter 1. I need a religious zealot who appeals to the scientific thinking of evolutionary biologist Brett Weinstein to explain the Darwinian benefits of being a faith-filled believer. As soon as the giant flying gull and penguin is entirely vanished, I find myself at a loss. The monster departed with too many questions left unanswered. And why did he quote Oswald Spengler's 1918 book, The Crime of the West, leading me with, observ with, with observation that our civilization has reached a stage in history called the Second Religiousness? As I reflect on this, I note that all the elements of my previous vision had disappeared. The five eldritch doors, the carmine red floors, the orange walls, poof, all gone without a trace. I now find myself in an undifferentiated dark room. What do I do now? I begin meditating upon my surroundings, recalling the words of the famous psychologist Carl Gustav Jung on the subject of darkness. That is to say, the darkness of the human soul. Quote, People will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own souls. 
One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Could this hope be applicable to me, I mean right now? No sooner do I ask myself this question than I hear the unmistakable sound of parrot squawking. Then it happens. A small incandescent light bulb in the center of the room gradually increases its luminosity so as to render visible a squawking bird. The bird begins to speak. Squawk, squawk. Whatever you are meditating upon, it is of little import, for your thoughts are merely the thoughts of a mortal, and mortals do not endure for all generations. Squawk, squawk. As the resolution, as the resolution of the scene clears, I can now make out the bird's features. It is a grotesquely formed, tropical-looking species, but not exactly what I would call a parrot. In fact, it's not even close to a parrot. But all said, it qualifies, at least in my mind, as a tropical species of bird. In any event, it is not the sort of creature that I would imagine belittling, belittling a member of the human species. Nevertheless, there it stands before me with its green and yellow blended coloration, with its unseemly three-toed black feet. Moreover, its actual size is unworldly large, appearing to be just under four feet tall. And most of all, the avian bears a hideous and dangerous-looking beak, which kind of resembles a maw. But its untidiness notwithstanding, I am still in no mood to entertain the bird's insult, which I find insupportable. Tell me, bird creature, I challenge, I challenge, are you an immortal being that you should disparage me on account of my mortality? Well, are you? Well, I don't have immortality just yet, the bird says proudly. But of this much I am certain, my master has immortality. Your master, I am shocked at this word choice. Who is your master, bird? And may I speak with him in person to ascertain the facts concerning his immortality. Sacrilegious and transgressing human, of course you cannot speak with my master, the great Cerulean one. Not even I can consult with him directly. But I do believe in the stories concerning him that he possesses immortality and will give it to me also, provided that I follow the eleven precepts of the faithful. And then, filled with a sudden zeal, the tropical-looking bird announces in a loud voice, I must now disclose to you the representation of the great master, the Cerulean one, in the act of creating the world. Is this some sort of proselytization attempt? If so, I decline. I am required to do this for the fifth precept of the eleven precepts. Clear, clearly states that true believers must share the sacred representation of the world's creation to non-believers. At, at such times as seem, seem propitious. In this way, non-believers are without excuse. The preacher excitedly produces from under his left wing a folded rectangle of thick artist canvas. He practically unfolds the rectangle to reveal an image of the world's creation, or so he zealously calls it. Behold the Cerulean one's handiwork, shouts the bird, and contemplate the, maj the majesty thereof. And on the painted canvas is a curious scene, the distinct parts of which are discernible, but the whole of which is indiscernible. There is a sandy desert plain and a fulgy yellow sun. Moreover, the sun has twelve tons of fire emanating from its corona. In the background, there are three multicolored and humongous flowers, as well as two dragons flying in the air above. But the foreground is what takes center stage. On an elevated hillock is standing a cerulean blue penguin with emerald green eyes. In its slippers, it holds an unadorned metal vessel. I am at once curious about the full meaning of the scene, and in, in particular about the contents of the metal vessel. So, impelled by curiosity, I inquire further. So what exactly am I looking at? I replied curtly to the parrot bird in such a way as to hide my true and intense curiosity. Upon hearing my question, the bird's countenance is raised up. He then begins to explain the mystery of the beginning. The, the etiological tale begins thusly. Before there were civilized beings, the cerulean one of all efficacy came down into the middle of the boundless desert of the Fulton Sun. Now in those days, the whole world was only a desert territory with very little water. So the, Cerul so the Cerulean one humbled himself to descend into such a dry place. And he said, I will now do this thing so that a miracle might be said to have been wrought upon the earth. And having declared this, 
He opened a silver vessel of wonders, from which came forth five particular things, three enormous seeds and two dragons. And the three seeds grow deep within the ground. Then they emerged forth and blossomed as the three flowers of succulents. As for the two dragons, they were called, they were called unbelief and self-righteousness. Now from the three flowers of succulents came forth enough sweetness and water to sustain large societies and even civilizations. But the peoples of the earth did not recognize the Cerulean one had done all this, because the dragons named unbelief and self-righteousness had also been working their deceptions throughout the whole world. The dragon called unbelief is the main cause of atheism, and the dragon called self-righteousness is the main cause of humanism. The tropical bird finished his retelling with a look of triumph, and then, jokingly, he hops in my direction in a manner that gives me a start. He continues speaking, but now with his positive emotions flowing, the avoidant bird spews his words with a prime confidence. So you see, now you, now you can believe and extol the name of Cerulean One too, realizing that it was he who has done all of this. After displaying a satisfied grin, the bird now stays intently, stares intently on my face, waiting for an affirmative reply, a reply which is not coming. I'm sorry, but I can't take that story to be the truth. And then that means the bird's voice grows dark. That the dragons have you, don't they? I don't believe in that either, I respond frankly. The bird is now back in his countenance, but seems to regroup himself for the next point of persuasion. For his next point of persuasion. Well, if, if what, well, if what, what if I told you that by accepting this belief you would gain a powerful form of meta the metaphorical truth. You know, the kind of truth formulated by evolutionary biologist Brett Weinstein. He is human like you, so you must have to consider this possibility, right? Metaphorical truth? Brett Weinstein? These references are unexpected and leave my mouth a dog. I am now very confounded. For the tropical bird has just resorted to an argument that used, the, that, that used religion as a mode of behavior whose merits are grounded in its high adaptive value in evolutionary terms. Wait a minute, Mr. Parrot like Jane. Did you just suggest that I consider the metaphorical truth of Brett Weinstein's argument as a valid reason for becoming a member of your community of the faithful? Squawk, squawk. Yes, metaphorical truth. Squawk. The bird stands his feet. And if you join our religious community now, then we can assure that you will also be putting your offspring in a more advantageous position to receive the revelation of metaphorical truth as well. So how about it? Madness, I think to myself. I can't believe that this Davian adept is asserting that if I just accepted religious beliefs, then I will thereby indefinitely increase my genome evolutionary fitness. That is to say, the ability to produce more viable offspring in the evolutionary struggle for survival. Evolutionary biologist at Weinstein defines the metaphorical truth as an assertion which, although literally false, still puts the believer in a more advantageous situation, Darwinian-wise, than what would otherwise be the case without the assertion. So, functionally, there is no reason to see religiosity as a mere delusion. In fact, natural selection should explain the reason why so many people possess high degrees of religiosity. I look straight at the bird, and it winks at me. Okay, I've had it. I feel the need to verbally confront the creature forthrightly, holding solidly to my own integrity. Okay, Mr. Perriman, I say in a manner akin to kind of confrontation. Is it the religious zealotry you have previously displayed incompatible with your reference to Brett Weinstein and his concept of metaphorical truth? Oh, really? Well, then, how am I any different than those humans in your world that speak somewhat as I do? At least in your case, I offer you what I offer you the chance to receive to receive the evolutionary benefits of metaphor truth in the form of resources for you and your offspring. At this point, I feel the need to interject with increased skepticism. What do you mean by resources for me and my offspring? What resources are something like you? or your community give me with regards to metaphorical truth. That's your question, human. Well, for starters, if you join the ranks of the faithful, then one day you and your offspring will partake of the flavorful and succulent fruits and vegetables of eternity. These nourishments will be directly manifest from the Cerulean One's silver vessel of wonders. Okay, great, I answered. But about the metaphorical truth that pertains 
to gain in the material world. You know, the advantage that equates to evolutionary advantage. It's important to note here that at this point I have ceased to speak sensibly about the use of the word true, and have given myself over entirely to my own curiosity as to what a creature, a creature like this bird might further say. The top of the bird begins to chortle, but refrains himself and then responds, Well, here's how it works. When, when you believe in the faith, you will try harder in life to reach your dangling carrot of eternity. In doing so, you will have more reproductive success, or at least that's supposed to be the idea. In the same rule of thought, the same rules apply for humans in various religions. But for us, it's even better because we are right about our religion, at least as far as we can tell. Upon saying this, the parrot-like bird proceeds to close its eyes and meditate upon the worthiness of its actions. I interpret this as such because after taking a deep and prolonged, I interpret this as such. I am now filled with both shock and a sense of the absurd. I respond, and I respond accordingly. What? What? So the benefit of which you speak is merely psychological benefit and nothing more? I am amused at the bird's unaccountable self-satisfaction throughout all of my misgivings. Well, so what? At least this belief has been a beneficial during the duration of one's life. And besides, who knows? What if this whole religious thing is true after all? It would only benefit us. If we are wrong, then we lose nothing when we die, when we die. But if we are right, then we gain eternity. It makes perfect sense, right? The bird breathes in another joyful contemplative breath of air, furthering its sense of self-contentment. Wait a minute, I move with a joke of revelation. So this is just Pascal Wager for you? I respond unambiguously. Furthermore, I am in no mood to discuss this part of their argument of the 17th century philosopher. You could say that if you could say that if you wanted to, in any case, I also need to emphasize the important benefit of gaining support of a community like ours, of a community like ours. In fact, it's perhaps the heart of metaphorical truth. The topical bird looks past me, seeing something that it recognizes, something that brings a smile to his face. And speaking of the community, here are four of your new brethren right now. I turn around to see them. I am not shocked at what I see, but I now feel acutely sick to my stomach. It's not that I'm judging these creatures, because I'm not. I just find it tragic that such unique souls are being held in bondage by, uh, held in the bondage of such a contrived dogma. And what's worse, their ringleader is a pragmatic opportunist who only seeks to build his business out of young birds who are hungry for real truth, not metaphorical truth. Chapter 2, The Intriguing Message, message of the Clear Force Family. But no sooner do I feel this sickness in my stomach than a couple of moments later, a mighty wind comes forth from the north. Then, in a twinkle, all the tropical-looking birds disappear on the spot. As the wind subsides, I hear their squawking voices singing a squawky song, all in one defiant unison. Humans choose to be a religious believer. Squawk. Because scientific studies show that religious people have more children. Squawk. And that means that Darwinian evolution favors them. Squawk. Yes. Choose to be a believer. Squawk, squawk. Yes. I can't believe what I'm hearing. And just as my mind is incredulous, so too my soul is vexed to hear words so contrary to the integrity of any religious-oriented belief system. Several moments of silence pass, for which I am several moments of science pa silence pass, for which I am grateful. But then I hear the voices of the birds again, this time proclaiming the, me the message in one, proclaiming the following message in one caustically mocking accord. He who wishes to gain his Darwinism must lose his Darwinism. Listen, and we shall explain to you this mystery. You see, he who loses his Darwinian faith is more likely to be religious religious. Consequently, such an individual will have more offspring, at least according to scientific studies and will thereby gain the fruits of Darwinian fruitfulness via his more numerous viable offspring. Yes, we are impelled to repeat that he who wishes to gain his Darwinism must lose his Darwinism. Upon hearing this, I am again moved, I am, ag I am again moved to voice my confusion, but this time I am filled with such perturbation that I answer with a voice that approximates a shout. Who has brought all this madness? 
My words reverberate in a forceful echo, both unexpected and thought-provoking. Who hath wrought all this madness? Who hath wrought all this madness? Who hath wrought all this madness? Then, as if my voice has found a mighty listener from the invisible realm, the whole room is gobbled up, seemingly by the mysterious forces of time and space. I now find myself alone in a celestial zone of stars, moons, and wondrous nebulae. There is no floor below me and no ceiling above. Here, in this space out ceiling, I vaguely test glimpses of the multitudinous but two distant possibilities of existence. But as, but as soon as I focus my mind on the fact that there is no ground upon which to stand, then I see the ground drawn near to my feet. In a flash, I am provided with a place to stand, and I am soon standing straight up in a picturesque and snowy landscape at twilight. It is very cold, but where exactly am I? I inspect the scenery of this new vista, which resembles an Arctic landscape in the heart of summer. Like I said, it is twilight and very cold from my perspective, but it's probably warm from the de- but it is probably warm for the denizens of this realm, or so I imagine. As I walk across the snowy landscape, I come across a patchwork of small, compact crystal mounds. The miniature hillocks of crystal, I think to myself, with more than a little wonder. As I walk past each crystal hillock, I take note of the vast discrepancy of size existing between one hillock and another. Some of them are even as small as four feet high and with a diameter of around nine feet. It is next to one of these small hillocks that I decide to stop so that I might better evaluate the landscape and skyscape before me. I sit down on the crystal mound and look up enthusiastically, seeking to take in the vast immensities of the approaching night sky. My eyes directed skyward, I focus on the first stars emerging, anticipating how the fully formed constellations might appear. I am not left uninterrupted for long. I have company. No, I am on top of company. The mound begins to quake as just as, just as I am spotting some fine patches of yellow stars newly emerging in the night scene. I jump up and off of the hillock and back away a good 15 feet. It's a creature rising. It's a creature rising out of the crystal, hatching out of the crystal. No, it is the crystal itself. It begins to walk in my direction, albeit slowly and in a waddling manner. I am the clear course penguin, says the unnerving bee. An ambulatory, an ambulatory crystal penguin, and one made up of clear quartz crystal, no less. Impossible, I think to myself. But if that's impossible, then what is this creature? An animal? A mineral? Clearly not a vegetable. Whatever the case may be, this much is sure. The quartz monster is emitting a pulsating energy that is unsettling, unsettling to my nervous system. As for the creature's appearance, it looks somewhat demented, but I can't be sure that this uh, reflect. I can't be sure that this reflects its true state. If experience has taught me anything, it's that reading the emotional states of non-human inorganic creatures is dicey at best, completely untenable at worst. The creature starts speaking. Human, you must make haste to forget all the words spoken to you by Passero Rasmussen. This is my commandment unto you. Amazing, it even talks with a voice un- with, with a voice worthy of an inorganic being, too. Indeed, the crystal penguin's voice sounds like a child's voice, but one that has been augmented with by synthesizers to sound louder and more alien in nature. And by alien, I mean straight-up cinematic extraterrestrial alien. But there's no time to further ponder upon this point. My attention now turns to the penguin's words. He said that I am to forget the words of Passero Rasmussen, but who is that? All clear courts, all great clear courts penguin, I say ingratiatingly. Who is Passero Rasmussen? Rasmussen is a member of the cult called Brethren of the Cerulean One. You mean to say that, yes, he is the yellowish green bird with whom you were conversing. How do you know him? And what is your assessment of his religious beliefs and pragmatism? That's the relevant human. Remember, remember that you, remember that I have commanded you to forget all of Pastor O'Rasmus's words, and you shall do this forgetting promptly. Now take heed, for I am the clear porch penguin, who is mighty and gives you commandments by which, which you shall live. All of a sudden my mood changes, or to be more precise, something snaps within the fiber of my being. Now wait a minute, Crystal Bird, I explode with a newfound indignation. I don't care how mighty you think you are. I will not tolerate this sort of speech. It's too religious sounding. 
The Penguin gets me in intense glare, expecting me to back down, but I don't get into such intimidation. I resolve to match his glare with one of my own. For several intense seconds, there exists an impasse of two beings, one human, the other mineral animal, or at least something non-human. And then it happens. The tension breaks down when the clear crystal, when the, when the crystal quartz penguin nods in approbation. Very well done, human. Your correct response to my posing shows that you are now ready to engage in the real task at hand. The real task at hand, I repeat in a state of puzzlement. Yes, you see, what you experienced before was just a test. You shall now undergo the gauntlet for clarification. The what? The gauntlet for clarification is a trial in the form of a discursive confrontation with many unforeseen entities. And if you succeed at, cor and if you succeed at correctly assessing the veracity of their claims, then you will obtain what is known as the sublime relic of authentic clarification. That sounds absurd, I opine. And what if I flatly reject to undergoing this trial? Impossible, the court family scoffs. In the first place, you are already here. And secondly, you manifested this phenomena into your own life and on your own accord. The penguin nods to me, his eyes, his gleaming eyes thick, as if to say, yup, that's the real truth, and I'm not lying. But I did no such thing, I protest. Oh, really? You mean to tell me that you don't remember meditating upon this quote by Carl Gustav Jung? And with that, the penguin quotes the very words I was meditating upon a short while earlier. People will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own soul. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Chapter 3, the orange plump penguin who probably should have never been a sports fan. As soon as he finished recording Carl Gustav, Carl Gustav Jung's quote, as soon as he is done re-quoting, as soon as he is finished re-quoting Carl Gustav Jung, the crystal quartz penguin predictably vanishes. All right, I have it, I have shout, throwing my hands up. This has to be a dream, for where else can creatures display the ability to simply vanish on demand? But wait, what if? It then dawns on me that this might be more than just a dream. It could be, no, it has to be the gauntlet for clarification. So now that I am already in it, what do I do? I remember the clear court and what is words. And if you succeed at correctly assessing the veracity of their claims, then you will obtain what is known as a sublime relic of authentic clarification. <laughs>